In this week, we are going to uh, talk about so-called resting state brain activity. I think in the um, past two weeks, we spent um, around four hours uh, talking about how to perform so-called GLM, general linear model, um, on the so-called uh, task-specific fMRI data. We went through uh, first level analysis and uh, uh, the second level analysis. So we now know how to use the SPN12 package to identify the, uh, the location of brain activity uh, specifically for the um, test design. For example, we use the one back as well as the two back uh, experiment. So we can see bilateral prefrontal and uh, the bilateral parietal regions can be uh, activated during uh, the unback study. However, um, in this week, we are going to uh, talk about another uh, data set, that is the racing state uh, fMRI data set. During racing state, we actually uh, let subject do nothing. That means we didn't ask a subject to perform any uh, task or to give any response uh, during this kind of the scanning period. So we call this is sta uh, resting state. And during this kind of a period, we can still uh, discuss whether there is any brain activity during this time period. So again, please uh, go visit my website and uh, please download uh, today's handout and the materials uh, from today, uh, today's uh, topic. And uh, in this week, we not only use the MICRO and as well as the SPN12, we will uh, uh, use another uh, new toolbox called DPEBI, uh, Data Processing Analysis and Analysis for Brain Imaging. Please go uh, visit this website and download this toolbox. After you finish the download, please unzip uh, the package and we will set up the path later again in the mailable environment. And since this DPEBI is one of the toolbox that actually incorporates the functions of SPN. So you may suffer the same issue that if you in, uh, include uh, the Chinese character within your file path. So please do aware that try to not use the Chinese name uh, of the directory or the folder that you put the, all the data in. Okay, Just try to avoid this kind of the uh, Chinese character on your uh, file path or file name. Okay. So as you can uh, uh, see in the slide, that actually in this week we are going to talk about the brain activity during resting state. However, you can see that I actually delayed this sentence. Uh, in the past two weeks, we, we tried to find out the similarity using GLM between local both signals and the task design. However, in this week, we, when we talk about the brain activity during resting state, that actually you have no task design because you didn't get a block design or something else during this kind of scanning period. So you have no way to find out the similarity between signals, both signals and task design. So what else can you do? Is there any way that we still can identify the brain activity even we don't have the uh, task design on hand? Of course you have. So today we introduce, I think, uh, at least uh, two different approaches that are called Reho and uh, ALFF. We have these two different approaches that you can actually identify the brain acti activity or brain activation during resting state. So you can see the picture right here. The most popular or the most fa uh, famous network or brain activity is the deformal network. That means even you uh, let subject do nothing actually our brain still will activate a network called deformo. That, uh, that network, this network is actually very important for some kind of the self-referential experience that you will think about the experience or you will think about something highly related to yourself. So we still have a way uh, to identify this kind of the brain activity during racing state. That's what we are going to do today. Again, I just uh, leave all the parameters. We actually use the 
exactly the same parameters that we use for the task specific fMRI. Even during the resting state period, we still use the same parameters right here. Since we're going to have the image analysis today, I just try to leave all the parameters in this slide five. So if you need, just again come back to this slide and check all the parameters. So let's uh, start from the first decision. What is resting state fMRI? As you can see right there, uh, in the past two weeks, we used NBAC. That means working memory study uh, about the brain activation. And uh, during this kind of study, we, we normally uh, name this kind of uh, fMRI as the task-specific MRI because we actually let or ask our subject to give the response to the task. For example, this is kind of the uh, block design. During this kind of the uh, area or uh, period, we actually ask the subject to do nothing or simply see a white cross on the screen. This kind of a fixation uh, period right there. And during this kind of the uh, block design, you can see this kind of design, we actually let the subject to do the one back or two back uh, experiment right there. So subject need to actually looking at the screen to see uh, subsequently display the six digit number on the screen. And uh, you need to always check about whether the current digit is identical to the previous one or two, that is one back or two back study. So during this uh, period, subject need to do something that is uh, some kind of a task. And uh, alternatively come to this resting period, nothing need to be done. And again, task resting, task resting, task and resting. This is kind of the task specific. We try to identify is there any brain region exhibit pretty similar both profile that correlate highly correlated to the task design. That is what we did uh, in the past two weeks, right? So we call this kind of the task specific fMRI is a kind of the model best analysis. You may recall that we used GLM. When you design a GLM model, that means you need to specify where is the, st uh, the task onset, what is the period, what is the duration, and is there any regressor, other regressor you want to put in to this model. So this is kind of the model best analysis. Okay, And of course, uh, in the following weeks, I will show you, you can also use some model-free analysis. That means you can perform some kind of the uh, functional connectivity or even the analysis that we use today. You can also apply this to the test specific. So for the test specific fMRI, you have plenty in choice that you can use for the data analysis. However, when we come to the resting state fMRI, sometimes we call this RS to represent resting state. RS fMRI, that means you have no task model right there. All you can do is to find out a model-free approach to analyze your data, to identify the brain activity during this kind of period. So you can see now the bone signal right here, it's very hard to say that they have a kind of the pattern that, uh, for example, correlated to a kind of a test design. During the resting state, the uh, fluctuation, sometimes we say spontaneous fluctuation, uh, you have no model to uh, correlate with. So what you can do is you try to find out maybe the similarity, not between body signal and text design, but the similarity between brain regions. That, uh, another way you can do to find out uh, how brain collaborated with each other to, uh, I don't know, to maintain the situation during this racing state period. Okay. So this is a very two different things. You are now familiar with this one, but now we are trying to go to this one. So why racing state fMRI is that important? Actually, the very first, uh, very first uh, scientist to identify the racing state fMRI is this one. Uh, Professor Biswal is one of the uh, researcher actually report the importance of the racing state fMRI. He published a paper in uh, MRM. This is one of the classical journal uh, called the Magnetic Resonance in Medicine. Uh, although the impact factor is not that high, however, this is a classical one. People in MRI will read the papers published in this journal. And uh, uh, Professor Biswal published a paper in 1995. He is the very first one to report, actually, there is something that you can find uh, during the racing state of MRI. 
You can see this picture. This is uh, one of the represent, uh, representative pi uh, picture published in this paper. You can see uh, for the A, A plot right here, this is actually the functional activation during motor task. So what you can do is you can use SPN. You can give the GLM model, and you can identify find these two regions or these three regions, A, B, and C, bilateral primary motor area and the supplementary motor area may have highly correlated bonus signal with the task design. Okay, so this is the uh, result from the GLM model uh, when you give the motor, dis uh, motor task to this object. However, for the B plot right here, you can see this is actually the correlation map, correlation map during resting state period. During this state, uh, subject actually doing nothing. Okay. However, you can try to using, for example, the correlation coefficient analysis, you can try to identify whether there is a high similarity between brain regions. How can you identify this result? Simply calculate the uh, linear correlation coefficient between uh, both signals from different brain regions. So if you can see that there is high correlation coefficient or high correlation between two body signals from two different uh, voxels, you may claim that actually they have a high functional connectivity or high uh, functional correlation between these two regions or two voxels. So you can see this is a map that identifies the high correlated regions uh, from one of the uh, primary motor cortex right here. You can see that when you pick for example, you pick the uh, right-hand side primary motor cortex as the state point. That is, you try to identify, is there any other both signals highly correlated to this one, or highly similar to this one? Then you will find out actually B and C will show high correlation to a region. Now you can see even subject uh, doing dancing during resting state period, you still can identify pretty similar pattern compared to the uh, motor task period right there. So that means actually during resting state FMI, our brain still have some kind of a pattern or activity that can actually reflect what you will uh, we have during the task period right there. So I think this is why you can see the topic right here. Functional connectivity or functional correlation in the motor cortex of resting human brain using EPI. It's still showing some hidden information that are highly correlated to the uh, task period right there. So this is the very first one that actually bring the attention, bring researchers' attention to this kind of a state, resting state. And why resting state is that important? Because in many, uh, in many different kinds of the patient or subjects, they actually cannot follow your orders. For example, you, you recruit the patient that, for example, minimal conscious, consciousness patient, that means they cannot respond to what you ask. Or if you recruit some dementia patient, they still cannot understand what you're talking about. Or children or pediatric subjects, that means you have no way to let them follow your order. So what you can do, you can uh, put them into the FMR scanner and just do the resting FMI. Still, you can find out uh, the brain activity during this state. Although it depends on the way you analyze the data, however, if you do it right, you still may find out some uh, meaningful uh, result from this kind of resting state data. Okay, so I think you definitely need to know this uh, very important publication published in 1995. Okay, so uh, for the resting state FMI analysis, we can actually uh, categorize all the analysis approach into these two different types. The first one is we try to de depict the local features of body signal. This is the one that we are going to uh, use or introduce today. And another one is you can try to find out the correlation between brain regions or between body signals. That is the functional connectivity analysis. We will leave this topic to the I think next two or three weeks we will or maybe next week, I, I forget about the agenda. However, we will talk about this uh, in the, uh, uh, after today, okay? So today we will focus on this one. Can we depict or can we identify local uh, brain activity 
using fMRI data, uh, using resting state fMRI data. So there are uh, at least uh, uh, three different uh, approach. Actually, there are two main categories right here. The first one we call regional homogeneity. That means we try to calculate the regional similarity uh, between neighboring voxels uh, uh, using the fMRI, uh, using the resting state fMRI data. Sometimes we will call it in short, we say reho. We put uh, these uh, two letters right here and two letters right here. We will say this is a reho approach. And then this is actually um, developed by this uh, researcher in uh, 2004 and published in neural imaging. This is uh, another very important journal in neural imaging uh, field. And another type is actually called amplitude of low frequency fluctuation, or in short, ALFF. And this one is a little bit different from this one. The first one is actually study the similarity in time domain between uh, several different both signals. However, this one is didn't talk about the similarity. It's actually calculated the uh, amplitude in frequency domain. That means when you have a temporal signal on hand, you can actually calculate the uh, Fourier transform. That means you can calculate the frequency spectrum. So uh, the research right here focus on the low frequency band that actually uh, between, I think, 0.1 uh, 0.01 to 0.08 hertz. This this band, they will calculate the amplitude on this specific a uh, specific band. Uh, this is so called the low frequency amplitude right here. So again, you can just take the uh, first letter right here, so it become the A L F F method. And I think in the very next year, uh, 2008. Uh, the same group actually published a modified method they called fractional ALFF. If you try to normalize the signal, so you can find a more, uh, uh, more, uh, more promising result from this kind of approach. So they uh, renamed the approach called ALFF. Okay, and I think this, actually, these three papers actually, uh, I think the first two uh, now have over a thousand and uh, I think over a, uh, a thousand and five hundred citations right now so I think this is a pretty important project right and for this one this is I think uh, still over seven or eight hundred citations right now okay so let's start from the uh, very first one reho regional homogeneity so what uh, what does reho represent actually they have a very strong assumption. This one, this is actually a sentence that uh, uh, quoted from the paper. Reho supposed, or regional homogeneity supposed, that factors within a functional brain area, that means within an area that actually collaborated with each other, were more temporally homogeneous or temporally similar with each other, okay? when this area is involved in a specific condition. So they have this very strong uh, uh, assumption that if you can identify a local region has a high similarity, you may say this brain region is actually activated uh, for a specific condition. However, you don't know what the condition is because this is not a task specific design. You can only say that they may collaborate with each other, so they have a very similar temporal pattern or profile, so you can claim they may have some kind of activity. Okay. And of course, this kind of method is model free because you don't really need to design a task. All you need to do is to find a way to quantify the similarity, of course, the temporal similarity between local voxels or between neighboring voxels right there. Okay. So you can see Reho right here is actually the uh, calculate the temporal similarity between neighbor voxels within a small cluster. You won't actually calculate the long distance similarity. That means you won't uh, consider the similarity between maybe prefrontal regions and occipital regions. You won't do that. For Reho, very first word is regional. So normally you will consider, I think, uh, as many as 27 voxels, neighboring voxels, uh, in this approach, okay. So this is normally we won't say this is one of the functional connectivity analysis because we don't consider any long distance connectivity right there. We only consider the regional homogeneity right here. Okay. So you can see this is actually a, a result figure 
uh, publishing this paper, the very first paper talking about the reho. So you can see KCC is one of the approach that we can quantify the regional similarity. Uh, KCC is uh, the abbreviation of Kendall's coefficient of concordance right here. Okay. So you can see KCC, you can calculate the KCC uh, for different uh, neighboring voxels. For example, seven neighboring voxels, or 19 neighboring voxels, or 27 neighboring voxels. And you can see this is a result. And you can see this is the FWHN, that is the smooth kernel, the size of the smoothing kernel. You can uh, use no smoothing effect and now increase to four millimeter or eight millimeter. So you can see with the increase of the uh, smooth effects right here, you can definitely see the regional homogeneity will increase because you put the smoothing effect right there. So st uh, start from the first row without smoothing, four millimeter smoothing and eight millimeter smoothing, you can definitely see that the regional homogeneity will increase. So you can see the area will increase when you have a larger smoothing effect right here. And again, when you calculate the uh, KCC considering seven to more neighboring voxels, you can again see, you can have a stronger uh, pattern right there. So you can see in the area may increase when you consider more pixels right there, okay. And this is the uh, z-value right here. So you can see even in this way, uh, you can still identify again the motor area right here. So you didn't uh, give any model design. But right here, if you simply consider the regional homogeneity, you can again find out the primary motor force for bilateral uh, cortex region, cortical regions, as well as the SMA, you can still identify the pretty similar result right here. That means Reho can still bring some meaningful uh, information that uh, maybe the regional homogeneity can really reflect uh, that the pixels are activated for specific condition. Again, I cannot say or claim what is the condition is. However, you can say there is a brain activity during racing state of MRI. So KCC is similarity. No, no, can give you an example. Yeah. So you can say KCC is one of the index to measure the similarity between neighboring voxels. And the FWHN is the parameters to adjust the smoothness. The number increased, that means you will increase the smoothness effect, okay? So I try to give you an, exam a, an example that how can we, uh, how we can calculate the KCC between neighboring voxels. Now I try to make things simple, so we only consider three neighboring voxels right here. So we have a, a blue, red, and uh, gold or yellow pixels right here. So for a condition one, I won't say this is a racing state, but just for uh, one of the condition, you can see actually the bold signal, we only have the uh, five time points right here. It's pretty simple example right here. And this is the uh, amplitude or the strength of the bold signal right here. For this specific condition one, you will see that actually these three voxels from three different locations, three voxels actually have the uh, identical bold signal right here. So you can only see one of the signal because actually they overlap with each other. So you can see they have three identical signals right here. So I would say the similarity between these three uh, factors is pretty high right now, okay? And for another condition, but the same pixels or same factors right here, you will see now the bold signal patterns is a, is a little bit different uh, between, each, between each other right here, okay? And for the condition three, I think I tried to create three ball signals that are actually very different from each other. So you can see this is the most similar one. This is a little bit uh, different one, but this is a very different one. So we have condition one, two, three. I try to give you these kind of the signals and we try to calculate the KCC. So we can see whether KCC can really reflect the similarity between uh, three different ball signals. So now we take the condition one as the example. Now, please take this matrix as the example. We have now three rows. We have three rows right here that represent three different voxels. And we have five columns right here. That means we have five different time points right here. So you can see original signals right here is maybe 13, 12, or 10, or somehow. But actually, we will try to simplify the signal, so we will 
uh, actually calculate the rank. Rank means the highest one will be assigned to, I think the the uh, I think the five. Okay, this one's the highest one. So I will give a five to this one because this is the highest one, and this one is actually four. Okay, this is a six, this is two, and this is one. So now you can calculate, replace the actual value by the rank. It will make things easier. And this is what is the uh, demanding for the KCC calculation right here. So now you can see even the uh, signal is a little bit different. I just try to give the rank. That means I will ignore the mean values difference between the both signals right here. So you can see that even the original signal is a little bit different. The rank for each voxel across different time point is actually identical right here. So it's just what we it's just what we uh, saw in this slide. We can have actually the identical signals from three different voxels. Okay, so rank right here is uh, identical right now. And uh, what you can do right now is now you know we have three voxels right here. We have five different time points. Now how can we calculate the KCC? You need to follow the formula right here. The very first one, you need to calculate the R value right here. How can you calculate this uh, R in uppercase? It's actually, you try to uh, calculate the summation of each column. So now right here, the summation for the first column, R1 is actually 12. Just uh, give the uh, summation of this, this first column right here. So this is 9, this is 3, this is 15, and this is 6. This is the very first step, calculate the summation of each column. In the next step, you are trying to calculate the mean value or average value across this uh, summation of column right here. So now you just calculate the average of 12, 9, 3, 15, and 6. You will get the mean value now is the 9 right now. And in your next step, you will calculate the difference, actually the uh, square of the difference between each column and the mean value right here. So you try to use the 19 minus 9 is for the first column, and you take the square right here. Then you calculate 9 minus average, again 9 right here, you take the square. Finally, you just give the summation of all the uh, square difference right there. So now the S right here, if you carefully calculate the, uh, the, the uh, summation of the square right here, you will see the S is now equals 19, 90 right here, okay. So finally, if you want to calculate the KCC, you need to follow this uh, formulation right here. Actually, S is what you, you, you got right here is 90. And the K, again, this is the number of voxels. So you put the three right here. N is the time points you have right here, so now it's five. So this is the final, uh, W is the final uh, parameters for KCC. Now you can see, in this case, W is actually equals 1. And uh, what you can uh, memorize right now is KCC is actually between 0 and 1. When you get a number of 1, that means it is the identical, it's the highest similarity that's, that actually the pixel, uh, the both signals from different voxels are identical. So we call this is uh, uh, unanimous measurements right here. Okay, this is the uh, one of the case we say condition 1. When come to the condition 2, if you may recall that the bullet profile is a little bit different between uh, these three different voxels right here. So again, in the very first step, we'll take the rank for each uh, body signal. So now, after uh, we calculate the rank right now, it's a little bit different, it's a little bit different between voxels right there, okay? Again, we have k equals 3, n equals 5 right here. Now you, again, need to ca carefully uh, calculate the uh, parameters follow the formula right here. So you can see now the S is uh, now S equals 24 right now. And now the final KCC coefficient is around 0.27. So now we have a lower concordance right here. And in the final condition, condition 3, I'd like to give you the another extremity, that means the zero condition. You can see we take the rank right now, I calculate all the steps on the numbers right here, you will find out that actually the S is zero. Why? Because I manipulate the, the, uh, the value, the summation of the 
uh, column is actually O equals uh, 9 right now. Okay. So you can see uh, the average is 9. So when you calculate this difference between each column and the average number right now, they all equals, uh, they all equal not a 0 right here. So you will definitely get the 0 value uh, for this W. Okay. So now this means when you get a KCC coefficient uh, equals 0, that means you have total dis disagreement between different both signals right there. Okay. So I think uh, KCC is one of the example, and I think this is an original approach. Um, I think some of the researchers did propose another way, I think it's called temporal coherence between both signals. However, KCC is still the most uh, uh, cited approach uh, currently. So you may still use the original way to calculate the original similarity. Okay, so if you now believe that KCC is one of uh, useful approach that we can quantify the regional similarity, then we can now actually uh, estimate estimate the similarity between neighboring voxel. However, you may see that how to define neighborhood for a given voxel. Now you have several different ways. We call it surface connected, edge connected, or corner connected. You can see right here, if this is the target voxel right here, in three, in three dimensional uh, fashion, you can see that so-called surface connected, actually we only consider the pixel that actually connected by surface right here. So you can see there is an uh, anterior, posterior, superior, inferior, and left and, uh, left and right voxels right here. So now we have uh, six, six connected neighbors. So if you say uh, the neighbors included itself, then we will have seven voxels right here, okay? And the edge connection right here, you can see is actually connected by the edge right here. So you can see we can easily get <coughs> 12 different pixels right here, connected by the edge, one of the edge, not by the surface. So if you have uh, 12, 12 edges for a given cube, then you will have 12 connected neighbors right here. And the final one is corner connected. So we have eight vertex for a cube, so we will have uh, eight uh, connected neighbors right here. So now you can see we can uh, have several different voxel cluster. For the very first one, six surface connected neighbors uh, included uh, itself, you can have the seven voxel cluster right here. And sometimes you will see 19 voxel cluster is actually the combination of surface connected one and the edge connected one. So you will have six neighbors right here, 12 neighbors right here, and include itself. So you will have a 19 voxel cluster. The final one is you if you con uh, consider all the conditions. So you will definitely have a 27 voxel cluster. It's just like a three by three, actually three by three by three cube right here. Okay, I just miss a three right here. Okay, so you can see this is the definition of the neighbors. When you try to calculate the KCC, now you calculate KCC among seven different voxel cluster, right? And this one, uh, 19 voxel cluster, and this one, 27 voxel cluster. There's no standard answer that which one you definitely should use for the KCC calculation. Each one is fine, depends on the condition, okay? So that's reho. However, there is another famous approach to uh, measure the resting state brain activity, that is so-called ALFF. Again, you can see um, the original activation right now is measured by the amplitude of low frequency band. Again, this low frequency band is actually specified uh, between 0 0.01, uh, between 0 0.01 and 0 0.08 hertz. I will show you in the next slide. And this is so-called a low-frequency band right here. Uh, for one of the study, uh, they actually report that you can uh, identify the visual cortex activation in this specific, uh, in this specific band, 0 0.034. It's a pretty, pretty low frequency right there. And you can see that um, actually people tend to believe that the activation or activity between 0 0.0 0 0.01 and 0 0.08 is the most profounding, profounding um, frequency band for brain activation. Because for other bands, 
higher than I think higher than 0.1 hertz is actually highly correlated to some physiological noise, for example, heartbeat or respiratory uh, frequency. So normally we will get rid of the higher frequency band and focus on this low frequency band. That is highly correlated for the brain activity. And why we say this band is highly correlated to the brain activity is that because the physical response is very low. If you, if you may recall that physical response is not that quick. This is very different from the neuronal activity. This is actually the physical response that normally will take two to six seconds to uh, actually achieve another uh, state. So the frequency band between 0 0.01 and 0 0.08 is actually the main target for brain activation study if you use the both signal. Okay, not the EEG, but the both signal. This band, this low frequency band is a target for your study. And there is another uh, report that, uh, again, from the base wall, uh, is claimed that the low frequency uh, amplitude is actually higher in gray matter compared to the white matter. It makes sense because the neur neuronal activity or the corresponding vascular re response is definitely higher in gray matter region compared to the white matter region. Okay, this is a location that uh, most uh, neuronal cells are located in. Okay. So you can see that the reho or functional connectivity is actually calculate the similarity between even between the uh, neighboring voxels or between uh, very far from each other's brain regions. However, the ALFF is not calculated the similarity. It's actually directly calculate the uh, amplitude of the regional activity. So in ALFF, you actually consider the single voxel, single voxels. What is the body signal profile? What is the frequency pattern for this local voxel? We'd like to calculate the amplitude of the low frequency band. That is uh, how ALFF do. So you can see if we have a higher, higher low frequency amplitude, we may uh, infer that uh, the brain activity is higher within this voxel. So flowchart right here uh, show you how the ALFF works. The first one, you definitely will have the signal preprocessing for the resting state FMI signal right here. Then you will do the bandpass filter. Okay, so bandpass filter, you will only uh, preserve the frequency band that's, I think, normally lower than uh, 0.1 hertz. Okay, then you will do the Fourier transform to see the power spectrum. That is actually the frequency power spectrum right here. So now the horizontal axis right here is no longer time time point. It's actually the frequency band. So you can see for different frequency band, normally we will have a very high or very strong uh, amplitude right here. This it may indicate the brain activity right here. We will focus on the uh, frequency band between 0 0.01 and 0 0.08. We will calculate the amplitude or specifically the area under curve to represent the brain activity right here. Okay. So sometimes uh, we may take the square root uh, because the power amplitude, we may sometimes uh, take the square root right here. And you can see during this period, the ALFF number is actually uh, the 14.60 uh, right here. And uh, we can standardize or normalize the, this value by global mean. That means we can uh, calculate uh, ALFF value for each voxel. But uh, finally, we can normalize this value by the uh, global result. So we will take uh, every single uh, every voxel's result as the uh, component, and we try to identify the uh, mean or the average value uh, for all the voxels. Now we will normalize the value to this one, or simply just minus the mean value right there. Okay. So now right here, you actually consider the frequency pattern for the body signal. However, as we mentioned before, that there is a modified version of the ALFF called fractional ALFF. Why we do so? Because sometimes you may find out that if you directly calculate the amplitude, they may have some bias. We take the two different locations as an example. The first one is PCC, post a posterior cingulate cortex around here. And the SC is actually the signal from the system. System is means there is a ventricle that is actually uh, composed of the CSF. That means uh, normally we won't anticipate there is any neuronal activity or vascular response we see. Okay, so we take a SC supracellular 
system as a reference point, and the PCC is one of the important brain uh, region for the uh, racing state activation. Okay. So you may see if you use the original ALFF approach, you will see this red curve right here. This is again the power spectrum right here. For the system, you may see they may have a higher amplitude compared to the PCC right here. However, this uh, inference may be wrong because it's very hard to say that uh, within the uh, uh, supracellular system, they may have a higher brain activity compared to the posterior cingular cortex. It may be very, very weird. So what you have to do is you try to uh, calculate the ratio, the ratio of power spectrum of this specific period to the entire frequency range. With this, this kind of the normalization, you will find out the PCC's uh, power spectrum right now is uh, compared to the uh, supracellular system is more makes sense now. You can see the amplitude is higher in PCC compared to the supracellular system. So actually, in a supracellular system, you have very high uh, amplitude located to a higher frequency band. This is actually contaminated by the uh, uh, respiratory frequency and uh, as well as the uh, heartbeat frequency right there. But uh, however, for the PCC original scene, you can see that the high frequency contamination is lower compared to the SC right here. So you can see without this kind of the normalization, we can now correctly claim that the PCC has higher brain activity compared to the uh, system area right here. Okay. So I think uh, after uh, 2008, uh, if ALFF is one of the approach, you need to consider. So sometimes people will actually calculate the ALFF along with the FALFF. They just calculate both values. So to s identify whether which one is more makes sense. Okay. Okay. So right now I think this is the first session. 